morning. It is really nice to be here, especially to talk about supermarkets. Good morning. Good morning. Um, when I first started writing about food, I was shocked to discover that a lot of people don't like to shop for food. It might be my favorite activity. Cool. Um, we love you. But there are a lot of people who hate food shopping, right? And there are people who want only organic, and there are people who want only packaged. And to me, it seems like a nightmare business, frankly. Low, low profits, pleasing many different kinds of people. It's hard. So I'm curious, like, what's it going to look like in 10 years? If there is such a thing as the typical supermarket, like, will you all be online? Will you be lots of small stores? What, what do you see coming? Well, what we see coming, I don't know that you can ever say a typical anything, because I think so many people will say this is typical, but customers are becoming increasingly diverse. So if you look at where, what we see it going, it's all of the above. So part of it will be online, part of it will be I want to pick up dinner, part of it will be I want it delivered, part of it will be uh, people still are social animals and they'll still shop, and some will be a small store. And if you look at what we're trying to do is to make sure that it's a completely seamless experience for the customer, regardless of where they go. What, is that, what does that mean? Like when I go, like I happen to, as I said, I like going to supermarkets. Right. What, wh how, what do you mean seamless for someone like? So um, the app, well, the Kroger app or whichever brand for us will be the thing that will tie it together. So things will be personalized to you. So if you're more focused on value, then the content that you will see will be more value-based. Hmm. But you can decide, do you want to stop by and pick it up on the way home? Or do you want to you shop for it? already bagged and ready for me. Yes. And we're doing that in over 400 stores today where a customer, you know, you can take your app. Uh, it, you can call up the things you bought before. You can just buy your favorites. Hmm. You can deselect. Um, you know, it'll take five to ten minutes to put together your list. Is that popular? Um, for some customers, it's incredibly popular. Um, and customers, when they have life event changes, is when it is really popular. So first kid, where you're like all of a sudden trying to reorganize everything. Uh, kids, when they go back to school, soccer, uh, those kind of events. Um, you know, single, single family, people where a spouse had passed away, those kind of things where it's just. Mm -hmm. But like if you, if you could start over and not have all the stores you have, would you be in the same position you are or would you do something differently? Is there like an ideal, there, so there's no ideal supermarket for, experience? For, for us, there, it isn't because we love all of those things. Hmm. And the customers that engage with us digitally still come in the store to shop. This probably is not a surprise to you since you're writing a book on supermarkets. Uh, no, it's not surprising to me, but I, I am fascinated by the changing nature of how we shop, how we get our food, uh, and the way grocery stores reflect our, both our confusion and our desires, uh, and how grocery stores respond to the changing America, the what changing do, what American What do you mean taste. they reflect our confusion? People don't know what to buy. They, you know, they, they go to the cereal aisle and they think that if, if they're in Whole Foods, you can still buy a version of Fruit Loops in Whole Foods, um, which is kind of ridiculous. They, but they think it's Whole Foods, so it's good for you. But it's, it's really not. And, and, and I think people are starting to recognize that. And they're, but they don't know what to buy. What should I eat? Is fat bad or is it good for me? What kind of fats? Um, people are very concerned now about what, what they eat and they want to know the answers. And I'd like to know if what responsibility does a grocer have to his customer um, in terms of eating well? If for, for us, we're always uh, completely focused on transparency. So I'm not going to judge what we think is good for you. Um, what does transparency mean? So that it's easy for you to understand how much sugar is in a product. Gotcha. If you want to minimize your sugar intake, we can take your shopping list and give you suggested items that we think you'll like the same, but will be less sugar. Um, if you think about diabetic, um, you know, customers that are on a budget, uh, the diabetic rate is double other customers. Um, so how do you help that person shop easier and know what items that if you like this item, you probably like this item too, and it has half the sugar. Mm -hmm. um, but you still you want to that. offer Cocoa Puffs. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, we're not going to judge. You know, we, we don't think we're in the business of telling others what they should eat. 
Um, we when do you want give to them those options when you say, if you like this, you might like this, but it has less sugar. Mm -hmm. Do you have any way of tracking whether people act on that? Yes. Yeah, there is no doubt um, that customers are increasingly, uh, this will end up sounding like a double negative, increasingly uh, eat less of what's bad for you. So mm. if you look at sugar, refined sugar, um, salt, sodium, uh, things like that, you can tell clearly customers overall are hmm. declining. And if you look at um, natural, organic, um, authenticity of food, um, knowing what's in the food, that continues to grow. But you know, the slopes are like this, um, you know, they're not like that. And do you see um, a direct result though between the sort of trying to ch uh, offer them information and the action? Oh, um, it's, it's, yeah, one of the great, yes, but it's slow. And we actually are partnered with um, USDA right now in a market on trying to help people that are on SNAP eat mm -hmm. healthier. And we're actually offering them coupons for produce. And the redemption rate is uh, less than 10%. Huh, but, why, why do you think that is? Um, knowing what to do with it, um, actually liking the item. Uh, as you know, on produce, you usually need to shop for it uh, two or three times a week or three mm -hmm. or four times a week because of the perishability of it. So I think it's all of those factors, but there is no doubt, you can clearly see that you're helping that customer change, mm -hmm. um, but the speed of change is slow. Um, but um, you know, the USDA has uh, been incredible partners on it uh, because we're trying to figure out how do you help people eat healthier without just saying, you can't buy this. Uh -huh. I mean, you raise that question. Do you think stores should refuse to stock food that is generally seen as not healthy? Um, it would be nice if that happened, but they'd go out of business. Um, grocers have to One have. One little downside. Yeah, if, 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 a, if a parent wants Cocoa Puffs, <laughs> Um, and he knows the, the, the store doesn't have them, he'll go somewhere else, and they have to respond to that. Um, so it's a matter of educating the public, um, and it's a, a long uphill struggle. And the first thing to do, I think, is not to talk about eating healthy, but eat nutritiously. Um, Why does that seem better? Well, because our food isn't healthy, we're healthy. We're healthy if mm. we eat nutritious food. Our food is dead. Um, and I think that well, that's kind of brutal. <laughs> I think I think that we need to think more. I clearly. guess you're going to watch them slaughter a hog later. <laughs> uh, are they really? I think so. Oh. Um, it it starts with words and, and understanding. We need to think better. We need to think in the store. And I think it's our, I think it's the job of the grocer to help the customer think about food and to appreciate food. That's what I think the but job why, is. What is it about grocery stores that made you decide to spend that much time thinking about them? And what, what, have you, what surprised you when you started studying that business? Um, I, I started writing about grocery. I've been writing about grocers for about a year and a half now um, <clears throat> because I was fascinated by grocery stores. Um, but why? This is, where, this is where most people get their food, and we don't know where it comes from. Where is all this food coming from? How can I walk into any store in America? 38,000 grocery stores approximately that do $2 million or more. Um, I can walk in any day of the year and get a pound of pea pods. Where are all these pea pods coming from? This one store I wrote about, um, 20 stores, uh, they bring in 32,000 pounds of carrots every week. Um, Kroger, therefore, must do by extrapolation, uh, I can't do the math, 32, 3 million pounds of carrots every week. And those carrots, Is he close? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, Sounds I, like a lot. Well, mul <laughs> multiply 32,000 pounds by 100, and I believe it's 3 million pounds. That's just Kroger. That doesn't even take in, into consideration Walmart, the biggest food retail, retail. And they're all coming from one place. They're coming from Bakersfield, California. How is this possible? <clears throat> also, I sense that we didn't appreciate grocery stores. I mean, it's an incredible luxury to be able to get inexpensive food anytime we want, r easily. Um, and yet we tend to denigrate grocery stores. We tend to elite, not pay attention to them or think they're a chore. Um, and also, I was curious about what, you know, how do they affect our food supply? I mean, we're at a place that, 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 that lauds the farmer and the small farmer and the medium-sized farmer. You're kind of reliant on big monocultures day to day. 
If, if you look at day to day, we are. But if you look at a ton of growth in natural, in local farmers, relationships with local farmers, um, and you have to develop those one farmer at a time. Like the store I shop in, the tomatoes we sell in that store comes from one county from the store, and we buy all the tomatoes he can grow. How does a chain of your size handle local? You, you allow each store manager to develop those relationships with farmers in their neighborhood. Then obviously from a food safety standpoint, you have certain standards that that farmer has to follow. So each store does this and goes out and finds the farmers? They, they can. Wow. Um, and you know, it's fascinating. Usually what happens is a, a store will develop a relationship with a farmer. That farmer will decide, this is kind of fun to do and it'll end up going to two or three stores. Mm -hmm. And then it's four or five stores. So if you look at, you know, one of my favorite ones is if you look at Olathe corn from Colorado, it started out at, we bought all their crop and we sold it in King Super stores around Colorado. More and more f local farmers over time started signing up for the Olathe branding. And then we picked it up in all of King Super's. So. This, is, this is a fascinating part about grocery stores. Um, they can actually change the way we grow food in America. And so I was wondering, are you, do you see yourself as affecting change in how we grow or produce food? Yeah, I would say we would look at ourselves facilitating change. Um, because, you know, we're an agent for our customer. Mm -hmm. And if that's what our customers want, then it's our responsibility to facilitate that change. Um, do you see anything beyond the sort of the move toward local and sustainable? Is there a a next call you're hearing from your customers? Like, you sound like you're very attuned to what is coming next and what the, the sort of leading edge of consumers are asking for. Is there, do you see anything on the horizon that will surprise us all in a year? Well, I don't think it's gonna surprise you, but if you look at vegetables and the importance of vegetables, it continues to accelerate. And, you know, in the past, vegetables were always something on the center the side of the plate. It's moving to the center of the plate. Uh, so I don't think it's going to surprise anyone in this audience that vegetables are increasingly important. I think what will surprise all of us is the scale of that importance. What vegetables are we liking the most? Besides carrots, obviously. <laughs> the, um, you know, it's, it's more, um, if you look at anything heirloom, mm -hmm and finding the original heirloom seeds and uh, figuring out a way to, to grow that in a way. Now the product is usually much more fragile so that's, you can't travel, it won't travel as far. Yeah, that uh, seems like a huge, I mean, it's always been a challenge, right? Waste, oh, but yes. when you have more local food and more heirloom food, is, has your waste problem increased? Uh, not at all, but we, we look at it from the whole supply chain standpoint. So if you look at the food that isn't uh, a quality that a customer will buy. Mm -hmm. We have relationships with over 100 uh, food st free store food banks. So uh, if you look at the last four years, we've been able to facilitate over a billion meals uh, with the relationships with the free store food bank. Um, last week I was in California and there in LA, or it's actually in Compton, we have an aerobic digester that the food that isn't good enough to give to a food bank uh, then we uh, re re recycle it, and it actually creates uh, Is an gas. aerobic digester the same thing as compost, or no? Um, in a that? very big scale. Huh. And okay. it's, it's actually, you take uh, these germs from the water plant, and it eats the material, it creates gas, and we use that gas to run the, um, most of the energy needs for the warehouse complex. Wow. I mean, it's, <laughs> I'm just like picturing that. Yeah. It's, it's really cool, super cool. And then the r materials that are left over after that you can use for fertilizer. And there's hmm. farmers that we have relationships with hmm. that they use it to fertilize their field. Is there anything, I mean, you sound like you're doing so many different kinds of things. Is there anything like when you look at the landscape of what you're doing that you wish you could start doing? So that that takes you in a direction that you would like to go and you're not there yet? The, well, the, the hardest thing is, um, I think, figuring out how to truly be energy neutral mm -hmm. in the grocery business. Uh, if you look, we've reduced our energy usage by 35% uh, since 2000. Uh, our goal by 2020 is to get it to 40%, but what's, you know, what's the other 60%? And that's really hard. 
I mean, I, I hate to be so crass, but oh, that's my that's nature. Fine. I'm do used you, to that. I don't my wife does too, so. <laughs> I don't understand how you can do all of these adventurous, sort of progressive, risky mm -hmm. things and still make money. What do you make the most money on? It, it's, how do I? It, it's, I mean, it's, is it Cocoa Puffs or is it Carrots? No, like, no. Like, I have no sense it, it's, of what you're. It's all the things together. So, you know, in our business, our margins are barely over 1%. So it's the total mm -hmm. all the pieces coming together. So if you look at uh, delivering products to the store, we've reduced our mileage by uh, 40%. Well, we deliver the cocoa puffs on the same truck that the organic cut carrots come on. So that- What department has the highest margin? Uh, the food, the restaurant part of the business would have the highest margins, really? but it would also have the highest labor. Right, I was gonna ask, do you make money in prepared foods and is prepared foods? No, um, it wouldn't be something that uh, our shareholders would be overly excited about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, for us, it's really important on terms of the whole package versus you're not gonna make money on every single thing you do. Um, and, you know, I'm gonna go backwards for a second on one of Michael's comment about the responsibility of food companies. Um, we introduced a product called uh, Simple Truth uh, f almost four years ago. And you, you can look up, it's free from 101 ingredients. So customers will look up and say, Am I, do I like those? Am, is that something that's consistent with my values? Well, this brand now is over a billion and a half dollar brand on an annual basis um, because it makes it's, it shopping. It's, it's uh, Kroger's owns it? Yes. Okay. And is it just kombucha or is it a whole line of... It's a whole line. It's 300 items. So... Um, and what links them all together? They're free of... Free of 101 different ingredients. What, so what does that mean? It's, it's usually all the ingredients and in packages that you oh, can't that pronounce. That people are trying to avoid. Okay. Right. I mean... Gotcha. Um, but um, so, f you know, if you talk to our customers time and time again, they'll say they like shopping this. Uh, because they've decided that that's consistent with how they want to eat, and they don't have to look at every package to say, okay, what's the ingredients? Mm -hmm. So you're telling them right away with that name that it's kind of safe for yes. whatever their issue is. Right, and we tell them what those are, and they can mm -hmm. decide, make that judgment. So this is just a, a, basically a private label that you have. You have many companies making various products. Yeah, correct. Where are you? Yeah. Okay. yeah, we would call it a corporate brand just because we think it's really important to think of the branding of this product. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the quality in this product is the same as what you could get anywhere else or better right. in some cases. I mean, if things that are local and sustainable and don't have a lot of unpronounceable ingredients in them are growing, what's, what's declining? What are you not stocking anymore? Since you started in this business when you were in high school, it's very, you must have seen he a lot of change. He started putting stickers on food in the 1970s at his local Kroger's. Yeah, I really That's did. Astonishing. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. what do you do in sales? One billion dollars? Uh, total sales of 110. 110 yeah, billion. A little over 110. Off by so, a suit um, of 100. <laughs> yeah. I've had a few different jobs along the way. They, um, I was joking with Trish and Michael beforehand. I always tell people I went to college on a Kroger scholarship. I just had to work 32 hours a week to get it. <laughs> the, the, um, you know, if, if you look at things uh, that are, first of all, we keep making the store a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. So part of the way you address your issue is you have a store, you have more space to work with. Really, you're getting bigger. Yeah. How big? Uh, if our typical uh, new store would be 110 to 120,000 square feet. Um, but if you look at the size of that produce department, that produce department will be four times bigger than the produce department I worked in. Really? The, the store that I shop, most of my shopping at the produce volume alone is multiples of the volume of the store that I worked in. Just the produce department. So, you know, when you think about your question, produce is massively growing and massively more important today for customers than it was three years ago, five years ago, 30 years ago. Um, some categories reinvent themselves, and, you know, coffee is my favorite one in terms of reinventing itself. Mm -hmm. Um, both from a convenience standpoint and all the local coffee companies that, um, you know, that, will, that will sell their product to maybe two, three, five stores. 
you know, I'm gonna, we can talk a little more, but also if you would all think of questions in a minute or two, I'd love to hear some questions from the audience if you have any. Could I, I, I would like to hear a response from um, Rodney on this vision of the grocery store. I was looking at a grocery store, I was looking at the vast center of the store, the majority of the retail space. Hmm. It's all full of stuff that we can order online now. And we're gonna start, It's 90% of it, it's just commodity stuff, toilet paper and, um, and you know, kitty litter and pet food and, and um, uh, water and soda and cereal. Do you, is there any chance that that's just gonna shrink because we're gonna get it online and that grocery stores are gonna become basically specialty stores once again? The, um, is there any concern about that? Well, yeah, they, you know, what is it, uh, all short questions, long answers, but um, I, I worry about everything. Um, <laughs> so do I worry about it? Yes. Uh, but what we try to do is make sure that we continue to change what we have inside our store. So if you look at natural and organic, it's growing double digit. It's $13 billion. Uh, t f 10 years ago, f 15 years ago, it was uh, less than a billion. So it takes more space. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at uh, natural and organic, last year we introduced over 7,000 new items. Uh, and, and that's mostly smaller suppliers. Mm -hmm. Well, that takes space to do it. It's really hard online to find all of those new products. It's really easy online for your consistent repurchase. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know what we try to do is, if that happens, we're there to supply it that route versus in a store, and we'll use that space for something else. Right. Or you'll make a store smaller. Or uh, it seems like a huge. Are there store. any questions before we run out of time? I don't know where to start. Yes. Uh, what is Kroger's definition? The, um, what is Kroger's the definition the, of local? Yeah. The, yeah. And. For, uh, it's a very easy question to ask, hard one to answer, and what we find is customers in different parts of the country define it differently. So in some parts of the country, it's actually the state. Other parts, it's a mileage based. Other parts is the neighborhood. So what we try to do is actually be reactive and supportive of what that community calls local. And the, um, and it's one of those things where if you just say this is what we're doing, it's, it's going to be wrong because in Texas, if it's from Texas, people in Texas consider it local. Uh, Big place. In Cincinnati, you know, you have Indiana and Kentucky within, you know, I, I can almost throw a baseball to them. Uh, local is within a certain distance. Um, and the, uh, yes? And I am from Texas, and I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned becoming more sustainable or use, becoming more efficient with energy use and some of the things that you're doing. Um, was any of that legislated, or was that just adjusting to what the customer wants? The, the, um, it, I'm trying to think. Um, for us, what we've done, it's neither. Uh, we started the journey literally 15 years ago um, because you can get so hung up on arguing green and um, the cl climate warming and all that. And we said, let's stop arguing about it because what's the downside if you become more efficient? So let's figure out how to become more efficient, how to reduce our energy footprint because regardless, it will allow, if we get good at it, the energy that we use to go another two or three or four generations. Um, so we spent all our, ener our energy, no pun intended, on figuring out how do we use less uh, and how do we use less in a way that's effective. And we just really don't take a position on global warming. We say people that spend a whole lot more time than us uh, will have a point of view on that. And obviously we've been incredibly successful. Uh, yes, in the back. Um, yeah, I was wondering how do you see the responsibility of the supermarkets addressing food deserts and aside from the, the food that you're not selling and giving it to food pantries, but actually getting into those communities? 
Well, if you look at food deserts, um, the last time I looked, I think we have a, almost 100 stores in areas that would be defined as food deserts. Um, obviously, we have to figure out a way to connect with that customer in a way that uh, we don't mind for the return to be less than our overall return, but we still have a responsibility for the shareholders to not um, you know, just keep losing money. Um, we continue to, um, it's fascinating, if, if you look at uh, customers on a budget, they're increasingly eating healthier. And you know, for us, it's making sure that we have the right products in the stores. And if you look in Cincinnati, the, uh, one of the lower income areas is close to our office. And five years ago, you wouldn't have found any natural and organic in that store. The customers were very aggressive on letting us know they wanted it, and probably 10% of that store sales are. It's a really hard thing to do uh, because it really is a one store at a time. And you know, we really work. Uh, if you look at LA, we opened a store up in uh, downtown uh, 10 or 12 years ago. And it took a few years for that to be something that you were happy you had. Why would you open in a food desert, though? How would you tell your shareholder? Well, we, we would open up where we think, right, we would open up where we think we can be successful. Um, but we, underst we are, understand that that may be a little longer than some of the other stores. And you have to have a balance. I mean, if we all of a sudden said, that's the only store we're going to open, then our shareholders wouldn't be very understanding. And, and we are trying to figure out, we think it's really important, so how do you figure out how to be successful? Um, yes? Oh, wait. Sorry. Just following up on your answer to the question about uh, customers in food deserts, you said that they're increasingly demanding healthier food. Do you know why? Um, the, um, every customer, almost every customer wants to eat healthy. Sometimes they don't because they don't understand. Sometimes they don't because they don't know what the alternatives are. Sometimes it's the price. And we, uh, you know, like on price, we don't believe just because something is natural and organic, we should make more money on it. So we don't have a, you know, we're not out trying to have a 40 margin on this and a 20 margin on this. We'll, we approach it the same. So what we're trying to do is make it affordable uh, for people, and I think that's what it is. Uh, we also have a partnership uh, with a company called Lucky's uh, out of uh, Boulder, Colorado, and, and their tagline is, uh, 99% organics for the other 99%. And uh, it really is focused on the value uh, for the customer. So I think a lot of it is just the price that somebody has to pay and how do you make it affordable. You know, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much for doing this and being with us. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I'm going to get, get in trouble, but OK. Right. Hi, Rob. I think that the folks you hear about Kroger and cheese. <laughs> that would be Murray's cheese. Yeah, that would be Murray's, and, and Rob is our partner. Uh, uh, if you're from New York, obviously you know Rob and know his cheese shops, Rob and Nina. Uh, we partnered together about 10 years ago. Uh, we have it in over 300 Kroger stores today. And Rob has been an incredible partner on teaching our associates how to love food, and cheese especially. And he teaches our associates, and uh, it's been a beautiful partnership. Sorry, All right. Trish. Nope. <laughs> Great place to end. Thank you. Thanks.